Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We're an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we are today with the one and only Kenny Kramer at the Producers Club Theater in Hell's Kitchen. Ken, this is a dream show for me, okay? Because Seinfeld, I think, was one of the greatest shows of all time. Absolutely one of my favorite shows. And to actually talk to a man who inspired one of the main characters, Cosmo Kramer, who was like the ultimate clown of, I would say, the second half of the 20th century because that show nailed it that show nailed the zeitgeist okay and this is the man himself in the flesh the real kramer and we have a whole hour with this man to get deep into that relationship between his relationship with comedy how he inspired that show let's start right with the beginning okay you were living across the hall from larry david who was a fr no no okay start let's start with the beginning how did you inspire Cosmo Kramer, the fictional character. How did the real you inspire that character? Okay, I had uh, I had moved into this building called Manhattan Plaza, which was a federally subsidized building for performing artists. A very unusual thing, but this is when the neighborhood was a real dump, and you know, and and so it was the first high rise in the area. And uh, Larry moved in at around the same time. Larry David, that is. And the management of the building thought it would be cool to like have a cabaret night utilizing the talent of these people in the building. And they asked me if I would coordinate the show and help them. I was happy to do it. And this is how I meet Larry. They give me a list of the comedians for, for the show. And uh, everybody was thrilled to be a part of it, except Larry, of course. And he said, I, I don't think so, Kramer. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think I don't think uh, my act belongs uh, in this show. I said, look, oh. I heard that you're really very funny, and why don't I come and I'll take a look at your act, and uh, if it's not appropriate, I'll tell you. So I went to the improv and saw his set, uh -huh. and on that particular night he was brilliant and mm -hmm. really rocked the house. And I said, I don't know what your problem is, but you'll be fine, you know, to do the cabaret show. So he agreed to do it. About an hour before we were going to start the show, he calls me up and says, I changed my mind, I can't do this. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you can't do it? He says, well, uh, I just don't feel right about it. I said, look, I can't waste my time with you. I got too much going on, but if you don't show up to do your set, we will not be talking again. And just in advance, I want to say, can I say go fuck yourself? Well, you're going to have to bleep it out. It's a family show. That's, that's what I said. <laughs> So at 9 o'clock, he walks into the room, does the show of his life, just absolutely rocks the whole place. And afterward, I had a party in my apartment for everybody that was in the show. And I said to him, you know, you were such a hit. I said, why were you reluctant to do the show? He said, well, I was afraid if I didn't do well and the management saw my act, they might kick me out of the building. <laughs> And that's uh, how our friendship began. That's it. Let's go even before that now, Kenny. Let's go in terms of growing up, in terms of how did you imbibe the spirit of humor from like the shows you watch, the movies. Coming in from Hoboken on the bus, I was talking to Claudia, and she's, she was curious to know if like the Honeymooners maybe had some influence. Because like, you see Ed Norton and Ralph, like the, they're always barging in on each other. What were your influences, seminal influences growing up as far as comedy? Well, you know, I grew up in the 50s, I guess it was, and uh, I just always loved comedians. I was, you know, watching the Ed Sullivan show. I had trouble with the honeymooners because I, I couldn't believe that Alice, this really attractive lady, could like be in love with this big, fat, abusive slob. That, 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 that kind of racked my reality. Like, well, what the heck's going on here? You know? well, it didn't seem real. How could she like be involved with this guy, a total jerk? Anyway. Yes. Uh, you know, so I, I watched, of course, The Honeymooners and the show of shows and all the comedy shows, and I was a big fan of comedy. You know, Milton Berle's show, he had a Colgate Comedy Hour. I was, you know, I was 
always always admired and loved comedians and said that's what I want to do I want to be a comedian and I made that decision at about the age of maybe six or eight oh. which is like totally unrealistic you never saw an eight-year-old stand up right? right were you a class clown in school yeah. yeah I was a class clown I was more important to get a laugh in the class than a decent grade on the course <laughs> and um, and so actually I, I started off I became a drummer I, I started studying drums and uh, I was, you know, an okay drummer. And I got into the High School of Performing Arts, uh, which was uh, sort of a miracle, but uh, there I was. And, uh, and I was, uh, you know, my trouble with being a drummer was that I got in about 10 years too early, you know? Mm. I got in at the point where the drummer like packs his own drums and schleps all that crap, you know? And, yeah, I'd do a gig and like the piano player's gone, the saxophone player's smoking the second joint and I'm still putting cymbals in cases, you know. It just didn't work. So, you know, had I got in like 10, 15 years later where, you know, you're in a rock and roll band and you have a drum technician and you show up carrying your sticks, you know. So anyway, I, uh, I, uh, so anyway, I was drumming and I uh, and, uh, was not very happy with it. And uh, a friend of mine uh, had a job as a driver for a comedian, a Catskill Mountain comic. And uh, he had just gotten DWI or something and lost his license and couldn't do the gig anymore and he wanted to know if I'd be interested in taking on the job. So I met the guy, his name was Jay Jason, he's you know, a working comic who in the Catskill Mountains in the in the 70s there was like 60 hotels up there and you know there was comics working all over the place any major comics that you caught the act up there oh yeah but you know the bigger hotels would have people like buddy hackett and alan king and uh, you know at the grossing is uh, where elizabeth taylor married eddie fisher you know there were a lot of big hotels you know was our friend pat cooper pat cooper was a guest on our show was he up there pat, pat, yeah pat was worked there you know they all every comic worked worked you know they you would get a deal for the season, you know, you'd get like, you know, uh, uh, 40 shows, you know, for, for a 10 week period. And, you know, and so all these guys, uh, Mousy and Lawrence and Freddie Roman and Freddie, Freddie, yeah, Freddie. And uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a whole clique of about 30 comics up there. So I was Jay's chauffeur, uh -huh. you know, and I would like drive him to his gig. And in the course of uh, taking him to his gig and meeting other comics, and I, I started writing jokes, and I would give my jokes to Jay, and Jay would go on stage and do my jokes, and they would kill. So I realized, like, you know, hey, you know, I could say those words. I wrote them. Or I could do it myself. That's how Woody Allen got started as well. He wrote jokes, and then he began to tell them. Right. Well, so anyway, Jay, uh, Jay started doing my material, and I. And he was very generous in wanting to help me to start doing comedy. And uh, eventually I developed a little act, you know, 10, 12 minutes and started going to like open mics and places like that. And then I got involved with an agent out on the island and he started booking me in, in you know, these sort of Italian restaurant type places. And... Uh, and then eventually I migrated down to Florida where I started working, you know, playing club dates on the beach. And, and from there I went to California and I spent a year working at the comedy store. Hollywood didn't pick you up at that point? Or? Well, you know, I was, uh, I was a regular at the comedy store in the early days when you know, it had just opened when I got to L.A. And uh, I mean, at this point there was only like four comedy clubs in the United States. You know, we're talking about 19... 72, 73. Is that where Leno and Letterman were, the comedy store? Who was? Who else was with the big names? When I was at the comedy store, well, the New York guys still were in New York, you know, um, but people like, uh, you know, Letterman would be one who would, who would be there. Jim Carrey was was there. Kippadato was a regular. Um, there was a bunch of guys that were working there. And... Uh, you know, in, in, in and amongst everything going on, I had a couple of auditions for television shows and stuff like that, but oh. didn't really nail anything. I was running out of money, so I figured I better get back to Miami where I could make a living. Mm. So I moved back to Miami, 
and uh, we started working again in these clubs, uh, you know, in the showrooms of the hotels on Miami Beach. And then I had a gig at a club in Philadelphia, and at this, oh, at this point, I got custody of my five-year-old daughter. She was, uh, she was living with me, and uh, my mother was living in North Jersey, and so I, uh, I booked a week at a club called the Bijou in Philadelphia. I was opening for the Flying Burrito Brothers, God bless them. <laughs> Okay. And uh, and I um, I went to uh, I so I came up with my daughter Melanie and uh, I drove up to 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 Jersey and dropped Melanie off with my mother so she could spend the week with her grandmother. Mm -hmm. I went back and did the gig, and the gig closed on Sunday night. And then I drove back to Jersey to pick Melanie up, and we were going to fly back to Miami on Monday. Mm -hmm. But as it turns out. And that particular Sunday in the real estate section of the New York Times, my mother saw this article about this new building that was opening up that was subsidized for performing artists. And so I went there the next day and it's this beautiful brand new high rise building and I put it in application and three months later they said you're in and I moved to Manhattan Plaza, met Larry David and the rest is history. Fabulous. So it's actually over now. No, 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 no. This is a lot more to get into here because now fame and fortune comes along. The show is a big hit. You're walking around. Now, did, did you, how did that make you feel? How did that make you feel to be watching a hit show with a character who's like one of the main characters and you know that that's based on you? How did that make you feel? First of all, it wasn't a hit show. It was, oh. it was, in the beginning, it was like, they didn't think they'd get picked up from one season to the next. You know, it was it was really on the rocks. And there was a one NBC executive named Rick Ludwin, who really championed and fought to keep the show on the air. You know, uh, Brandon Tartikoff, who was the president of NBC at the time, uh, he wanted to cancel it because it wasn't getting ratings. Well, it wasn't getting ratings because first of all, they put it up against Home Improvement, which was like the number one comedy on television. And it just languished, you know, 40s, 50s, you know, he was really down at the bottom. And, and you know, Tartico said, that's it, let's pull the plug on this. And Rick Ludwig said, look, this show gets great reviews. He says, it's just got a cult audience, but it gets great reviews. Can't we just do one show for the quality of having a show? Does it have to always depend on the ratings? And he really fought for it. And then they got another season. Uh, they got they got a. Uh, it started off with 13 weeks as a week as a winter replacement, a summer replacement. And then they got another. They got picked up another time. But then like a fluke happened. And that uh, Cheers, which was like the number one show on television, mm. and Ted Danza, who was the star of Cheers, yeah. the production company that had Cheers. As long as they had Cheers on the air, they owned the time slot that followed Cheers. It was like their, their time slot. And they had a show called Wings, which was following Cheers. Right. Well, when Ted Danson quit Cheers, they lost that slot, and so they threw Seinfeld in there. And what happened is, like, uh, the Cheers audience was a great audience, very great demographic. Right. And, and so they just, the, the suits at NBC decided, well, we'll put Seinfeld in there, we'll see just how much ratings it loses. Maybe it could retain some of that audience. And it turned out getting better numbers, Seinfeld started getting better numbers than Cheers. And so the brilliant suits, oh, we always knew this was a great show. <laughs> right. and, and so that's, it was like the third season that the show really took off and became like a, a hit show. But the first two or three years of that show, you know, they didn't know from one week to the next when the axe was going to drop. You're making me think now because Cheers also was a show that celebrated friendship and community, sitting at the bar, the place where everybody knows your name. And, and that was my attraction also for Seinfeld, that they were always at the coffee shops, always talking, always engaging, the, the friendship angle. Was that, was that in terms of like you and Larry David, were you guys hanging out and having these conversations? And it, was just, it was just intelligent humor, you yeah. know, it was a sophisticated, intelligent humor. But yet Kramer had that, you know, slapstick ingredient that added to it that, you know, made it accessible to kids who don't understand masturbation. You know, when he slaps down the money and says, I'm out. <laughs> you know, it's funny. He was not the master of his domain. No. <laughs> but, uh, 
you know, it's a very sophisticated, you know, a lot of the jokes are very esoteric, like the John Cheever letters and things like that, yeah. you know, so, but at the same time that it's really intelligent uh, and, and has a appeal to a, a great, you know, college-educated demographic, it also appeals to, like, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's totally, it's amazing how cross-generational and, yes. and cross-cultural the show is, you know, wow. it's probably the greatest audience in the history of television. Fabulous. I was watching a YouTube today of you with Howard Stern from 1996, and you, yeah, it's on YouTube, and you, you seem like very frustrated because you were trying to explain to Howard, you know, why the show mattered and the importance of it, and Howard just was like... He was an asshole. <laughs> we could bleep that out too? <laughs> he, was, he was a complete asshole. What happened was they called me up and they said, well, Howard would like to have you on the show. I said, great. Yeah. He said, so uh, w when, when do you want to do this? He says, well, what we want to do is we have the, the simulcast with the PIX with Channel 11 or something. And so what we'd like to do is we'll send the film crew over to your house and, you know, you'll do a phone with Howard while you'll be on film, you know. So I say, okay. So now I... Uh, they come, they set up in my house at five in the morning, and the, you know they're all set to roll. And I didn't hear the introduction, you know, to, to my segment, but I know how is being like kind of hostile, you know. I'm yeah. trying to explain to Larry Davis, the genius, is right. writing this show, and he's yeah. going, "No, I don't know who is that guy. He's, he's a nobody, and you're a nobody." And, oh boy. <laughs> and so the next day, a friend of mine taped the show, and he brings over the tape, and I listen to it, and it turns out that my introduction was. There's this guy on the phone, he says he's the real Kramer. Should, <laughs> should, should we let him on the show or not, you know? And I got a whole film crew in my house. And he made it like I was some schmuck trying to get onto his show. And uh, so, uh, so I was incensed and I, I wrote like a, a funny little thing, uh, essay called Howard Stern is a prick and I can prove it. Oh, jeez. And... Uh, <laughs> And so, and I explained, you know, how they asked me to come on the show. They set up my whole living room with f cameras and lights, and and then they pretend like that I'm trying to crash this show. I said, you know. So uh, anyway, uh, next thing I know, and I and I put it up on the internet on on, on yeah. the Howard Stern blog. Good. And the next morning, I turn on Stern, and he's reading my 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 letter. Oh. <laughs> so. But he's editing out the jokes. <laughs> oh my God! Maybe he's jealous of you. Yeah, right. So, uh, so I was really upset. So I called in. I had the hotline number, and they put me right on the air. I said, "You got some nerve, you know? You, you pretend like you know I'm trying to crash your show, and you got your whole crew in my living room." You look, oh, okay, you take a joke, Kramer. I said, "No, there's nothing funny about it." I said, "I'm, you know, I'm promoting a tour. I'm selling tickets, and I usually, if I." You know, I do like the morning zoo, I sell 100 seats. If I did your show, I didn't sell a single seat. I said, so you wasted my time. And uh, and not only that, but uh, at the time, he was really he was really riding on Seinfeld, because Seinfeld was dating Shona, Shoshona, oh, who was yes. like, you know, a high school senior, and he was 40 years old or something. Oh, yeah. So yes. that was like a big scandal that Howard was playing to the max. <laughs> Maybe these these two Jewish comics from Long Island, you think they would get along better, Jerry and Jerry Seinfeld and Howard Stern. Maybe there was some competition there. No, he just uh, he just picked up on uh, Jerry dating Shoshone and made it into a bit, you know, that he was like playing for all it's worth. Yeah. And I said Jerry stopped talking to him, but I said, you know, I said, and you know, the worst thing is that you know your audience is like eighty percent guys, and you broke the the, the code of the guys. He says, what's the code of the guys? I said, well, the code is never mess with your friend's woman, never sell out your tribe for a woman, and if it doesn't conflict with the first two, always help another guy get laid. That's the code of the guys. Well, what do you think the Me Too movement would say about that? Well, in any event, uh, <laughs> in any event, I nailed him for it. Okay. I said, you know, you're picking on Jerry, you know, with Shoshona. I said, you broke the code of the guys. And anyway, I understand that they still run that segment of me talking to him. People call me from time to time. I heard John Stern this morning. 
which means they must be some really hard up for material to keep running that same stupid segment. Uh, well, here's the thing with me. I love Howard Stern. I love you. I think you're great. We sort of have this six degrees of Howard thing now because we've had Pat Cooper on our show and he was on Howard several times and we have Jackie the Joke Man coming on. He's got a book out where he's trying to get back in with Howard, I think, in some way. And uh, are you? Do you have a friendship with a relationship with Howard or? Not really. I mean, just the two telephone conversations. But uh, I know Jackie very well. We're friends. Oh, you know Jackie. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, he wrote a book, and uh, yeah, I'm sure it's. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, I'm sure it's worthwhile. It's got to be a lot of. This guy knows more jokes than anybody I've ever met. It's just amazing how I many he jokes, jokes, jokes. It's uh, he's he's a treasury of jokes. <laughs> Right. Walking encyclopedia of jokes. What about you, Kenny? You think there's a book in you coming out sometime? Or? I have been writing a memoir, okay. and it's uh, coming along. i got about 65,000 words at this point. <laughs> so, How many pages is that? Uh, well, to an average book is usually about 90,000 pages. Nine so words, yeah. Okay. 90,000 words. Your book, 90,000 pages? Well, the world wants to know about every detail of your life. I think a book. <laughs> 90,000 pages would be a lifetime of work and I'd never finish. No, it's, it's, it's about 90, you need about 90,000 words for the book. So I'm about two-thirds done, I would guess. And uh, it's interesting, you know, it's been a real cathartic experience writing about, you know, these gigs that I had and things that happened on the road and, you know, that kind of stuff. So. Well, I see, I'm fascinated. I think our, our audience is fascinated about the life of the real Kramer. The show takes off big, and now here you are walking around. What What is it like? Do people come up to you? Once Once the word gets out that you are the real Kramer, how? what kind of interactions did you have that were interesting? When, when it happened, yeah. the way it happened was that uh, there was a, a writer named Michael Kramer. Hmm. and Another Kramer. Yeah, he, he calls himself a gonzo journalist, okay? okay? So uh, Rolling Stone did a cover story on Seinfeld. And in that cover story, there was one line that said, the character Kramer was based on a neighbor of Larry David's who lived across the hall from him in the 70s. Mm. And so Michael Kramer decided, I'm going to find the real Kramer, OK? Mm. This was before we had internet, and you could just Google and find somebody. Mm. So he was an investigative journalist. He went to the library and he got old phone books from like the 70s and he looked up Larry David and found an address for Larry and then he cross-checked with all the Kramers to see if he found a Kramer that had the same address as Larry David. Mm. My phone rings and says, uh, hello, is this Kenny Kramer? Yeah. You're Larry David's friend, right? Yeah. Eureka, I found the real Kramer. Ah. <laughs> so he sold the story to page six of the, 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 the Post. And then uh, there was, was that Liz Smith at that time, or no, it okay. was uh, Richard Johnson, I think. Okay. Okay. So and then, of course, the Daily News did a little thing about it, and you know, and then so on on the publicity that I got, this little bit of publicity, I decided, well, I should do something about this because Kramer is, you know, obviously pretty popular. Cash in. And so uh, my initial idea was to do a. Uh, a CD-ROM, which was a very big thing, a big thing at that time. It was basically a CD disc that you couldn't record over. It had content. It, right, you know. right. and, and so, you know, the character Kramer was always known for, like, uh, you know, where to go to theater for free and movies and, you know, how to move around, you know, a guide to New York. Free bathrooms and... Best bathrooms in town or whatever. <laughs> right. So I wrote a proposal for this project which was going to be a CD round called Kramer's New York mm. and I went to pitch it because at this time all the big publishers were starting in electronic publishing divisions you know that was like the big thing now it was, it was going to be and so I went around and pitched a couple of places with my proposal and basically the feedback I got was like well what you're really offering is nothing more than a database of restaurants and films and you know I says what you need to have a hit is you need entertainment content or you need a game. Those are the two things that sell big time. So now I go home and I'm thinking, entertainment content, what uh, what could I do for entertainment? And I'm 
looking out my window and a gray line bus rolls past my window and a light bulb goes off as Eureka. Because I was calling it the Seinfeld reality check and then yes. I said, no, a Seinfeld reality tour. Four. Yeah, what an idea. Wow. So I, I get on the phone and within a few minutes I called Gray Line Sightseeing, explained who I was. They put me on the phone with the president of Gray Line, a guy named Charlie Flateman. And I explained to him what I want to do, and I want Gray Line to give me a bus and drive it so we could shoot the content for the CD-ROM, and Gray Line would be, uh, would be named as a title sponsor and, you know, an official transportation company of the Kramer Reality Tour. Yeah. So Charlie readily agrees. I come in, I have a meeting, and we're going to do this. And uh, he says, well, I'm happy to provide a bus and a driver for this project. He says, but... Did you ever think of really making it into a tour? You know, because that's what we do at Greylight. We run tours. Yeah. I said, no, that hadn't really occurred to me. He says, well, think about it. You know, you could make this into a tour. We could run it, you know, seven days a week. It could be very profitable. Mm. And I said, okay, let me, let me. So I, I went and uh, they insisted that before they would ha have me do this, I had to get my New York sightseeing tour guide license, which okay. I got. Uh -huh. Getting a sightseeing tour guide license is, is really very... Uh, it's not that difficult. You really need to answer one question. Yes. Are there any warrants out for your arrest? <laughs> that, that's what they care about. That's, that's the whole thing. Are there any outstanding warrants? Or do you owe child uh, support? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so unfortunately, I passed those two the qualifications. And then a friend of mine, Bobby, Bobby Allen Brooks, helped me, and we wrote... Uh, an itinerary, itinerary of where the bus should go and the little stories that'll go with the bus. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then Greyline was difficult to work with because we wanted to have some test runs. You know, I needed to have a DVD player and the bus and the buses, they sent me, never had working DVD players and the drivers were mm -hmm. upset that they had to, uh, uh, you know, miss a working, you know, because they get tips and, you know, now so... Anyway, and they were supposed to sell my tickets on an 800 number, which I'd never answered. So I, I just said, forget it, I'll do it myself. And I hired a van company and booked this little theater across the street from my house. And, uh, and now I was stuck. I had like a theater booked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had this tour going to start like in two weeks. How do I sell tickets? You know, how am I going to sell tickets? Who the hell is going to buy a ticket to this? Nobody knows. So now, backstory: like about a year before, I was in Miami uh, on a holiday of doing some gigs, mm -hmm. and I get a message on my answering machine. Remember answering machines? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I carried this little thing that went beep, and you put it into the phone. Yeah. Two beeps to rewind. <laughs> So there's this message on my answering machine. Hi, this is John Tierney of the New York Times. I'm doing a story about Seinfeld, and I'd like to know if you would like to comment. So my number is blah, 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 and I pulled out a piece of paper from my pocket, wrote down his number, put it back in my pocket. I had actually forgotten to call him back because at the time, you know, the Jerry Shoshone thing was like, you know, and I figured they're going to ask me questions about Shoshone, and I don't even need this, you know. So I didn't bother calling him back. I get home from Florida, and I empty my pockets, and there I got this guy, John Tierney, and his phone number. So I put it with a push pin into my bulletin board, didn't think a word about it, sat there for a year. Yeah. And now I got the show that's starting in two weeks, and I need to sell tickets, and I see that name on my bulletin board, John Tierney, New York Times. I said, what the hell? You know? <laughs> right. So I pick up the phone, and I dial John Tierney's phone number. Machine, his answering machine goes off. He says, hi, this is John Tierney, the New York Times. Please leave a message at the tone. Beep. And I go, hi, John Tierney. This is Kenny Kramer, Larry David, Jerry Seinfeld's friend. I'm returning your call. And this oh, is like a year later. Year later. Okay. <laughs> so so he's, he's screening his calls. He picks up and says, well, it's about time. I've been waiting here for your call. You know? yeah. and, and so I kibbis with him for a little bit. Then I told him the reason I'm calling is that I have this show that was started. We're in rehearsal now, and we're putting it together, and it's going to be the world of Seinfeld, what's actual, what's factual in the world of Seinfeld. Mm. Is this something you'd like to write about? Mm. He says, well, usually, he says, uh, you know, I write in the magazine section. I do articles, but 
Um, let me call Metro and see if they're interested in the story. And Ten minutes later, he calls back. He says, they want to do the story. Mm. So he meets me on a Saturday morning, and I totally bullshitted him about the tour. You know, they, they were in rehearsal and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I had an idea, and I knew I was enough of a performer I could pull it off. But I had no mm. script. I had The only thing I had was like... I figured I'd start in the theater and then we'd move to a bus and we'd go to these locations, Mr. Pitt's house and the right. Soup Nazi. Oh, yes. This was actually, this was before the Soup Nazi, but okay. I had, you know, mapped out a number of locations. And, and uh, then I took him, so he spent about two hours interviewing me and uh, mm. it's, the story's online. If you just oh. Google John Tierney, New York Times Kramer, it's a great story. The, guy, the guy's a gifted writer. Mm. So... Uh, Anyway, next thing I know, does the story. Kramer's starting a tour. It's the front page of the Metro section. My picture above the fold, which I didn't know at the time was a big deal. And uh, oh, one of the things that happened, <laughs> I guess the statute of limitations is over on this, I can tell you. But one of the things that happened, I had acquired the phone number 1-800-Kramers. That's 1-800... <laughs> Kramers. Yeah, I mean, one eight hundred five seven two six three seven seven. Check, right. check your dial. Okay. Five seven two six three seven seven spells Kramers. Right. So I had this number one eight hundred Kramers. And you know, originally I thought I would use it to get bookings, but since uh, I made a deal in the theater was going to do the bookings, I didn't need to give out the number. And, you know, I would use it like at parties if I met a woman or something. Well, give me a call, a Kramer, 1-800-Kramer. <laughs> yeah. It's very, very hip, you know? That's right. Very cool. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, in the course of the story with John Tierney in the interview, they were talking about that if I wanted to have 1-800-Kramers in the story. And I said, no, you know. Mm. And they convinced me to, to use it, okay? Mm. So now it's January 18th, 1996. Five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, something like that. My phone rings. Hello? Oh, instead of, you know, 1-800-Kramers is like a you know, virtual number call forwarded to my house phone line, okay? So the phone rings like four in the morning. Uh, hi, is this Kenny Kramer? I said, yes. He says, Mr. Kramer, my name is so-and-so. I work for the New York Daily News. I just picked up the newspaper of the New York Times on my way home from work. And you have an excellent story in there. It's unbelievable, the story you have. I said, oh, really? Okay, thank you, thank you. He says, he says take my word for it. After tonight, your life will never be the same. And he hung up, you know. Oh Within 10 minutes, the phone started ringing off the hook. And when I ever hear it rang off the hook, if you take it off, it rings, you put it down, <laughs> rings, pick it up, put it down, oh, rings, okay. pick it up, put it down, rings. <gasps> I, I went on all day, and then, of course, print... Because of a Daily News article? No, the New York Times article. Because of the Times piece. Oh. It was a writer at the News that's, that saw the article in the oh, Times. I yeah. see. He, see, so... Uh, oh, my. So the phone is, like, ringing off the hook, and, of course, in the world of media, print drives broadcast media. Right. So, of course, all the assignment editors at all the networks and news shows come in at, like, you know, 5 in the morning to look at that day's papers to see what stories right. to cover. Right, right, right. And so now I have phone calls from hard copy, Inside Edition, Entertainment Tonight, Channel 2, Channel 5, Channel 7. I had them stacked up in my lobby, sending them up one at a time for interviews. And I was just actually famous. That day I became famous. I, every place I went, it's Kramer, Kramer, Kramer. Yeah. Oh it, was, it was pretty amazing. And then, then, of course, the tour sold out. I was doing two on Saturday, two on Sunday, and we sold out 10 weeks of tours, like, in a matter of hours. Mm. And uh, mm. it became quite successful, you know. Larry and Jerry got a big kick out of it. They called me from L.A., congratulate <laughs> me on the story. They couldn't uh. believe that uh, I pulled it off. Uh. And that was, uh, that was how it began, the, the real Kramer uh, saga, or whatever you want to call it. And the saga will go on. The saga continues. On the tour, which is on a winter hiatus right now, starts again on, on um, March 31st. It'll be my 22nd year doing this. Yeah, 22 years. And I have a stage show based on the tour called Kramer on Seinfeld. In fact, if any of your viewers care to Google KramerOnSeinfeld.com, uh, I've translated the, the tour you know, to a stage performance. Fabulous. Fabulous. And, uh, How long is the show? 
about 90 minutes. It's okay. very entertaining. I can make it as long as I need it to be because I do various different types of things like theaters, colleges, corporate events, you know, hard tickets. So uh, It's a one-man show. Yeah. And I, have, I use film clips and clips of Larry talking about me and uh, I tell the stories behind the stories because, you know, there's a lot of things that happened in real life that ended up becoming episodes and adventures on Seinfeld. And I talk about a bunch of those things, and uh, it's a lot of fun, you know. If uh, you read TripAdvisor and see the reviews that I get, they're all five-star reviews, and everybody has a great time all the time, which is why I'm able to continue running without spending any money on advertising. Why isn't this on Broadway? I want to look in the camera right now and say, why is this not on Broadway? We got a lot of fluffy Broadway shows out there today. If it's on Broadway, you have to do it eight times a week. <laughs> Now, if Cosmo and I have one thing in common, neither of us have much of a work ethic. <laughs> My philosophy is hard work probably won't kill you, but why take a chance? I love it. And so, you know, I, I started off doing the tour two on Saturday, two on Sunday, and the tour is about three hours long, so it's like six hours plus of talking, oh, which yeah. was quite a bit. It's a lot of work, yeah. Yeah, so I cut it down to just one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Good. And then 9 11 happened. Oh, yeah. And the tourism just dropped dead, you know. The, the, I, I couldn't get enough people to do one on Saturday, one on Sunday, so I just did one on Saturdays. Mm. I did that for about a year. Gradually, people started coming to New York. They felt it was special to support New York and come to New York. And, and so tourism is up, and I now have enough people that I'm turning away people. I could be doing one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Mm. But during that year, I was just doing once a week on Saturday. I felt really comfortable knowing, like, okay, I do this on Saturday, and then I'm done for the rest of the week, and my life right. is my own again. Mm. And so I never went back to two. Oh. I just kept it one on Saturdays. And to this day, with the exception of, you know, a couple of times a season, like, I'm, I'm doing Saturday and Sunday on Memorial Weekend because oh. I just turn away so many people, you know, on those big holiday weekends. And, uh, you know, life goes on. So you're a theater star. You're an actor also. I don't know about an actor. I'm still basically a stand-up, you know. Uh -huh. But I just tell a lot of funny stories about a particular television show that had a character based on me. I want to talk a little bit about uh, how our lives sort of intersected in some way in 1997, which was the year that I broke up with my first wife, okay. Uh, I began a career as an educator, as an English teacher that year, okay. Uh, moved out of my wife's apartment in Hoboken and in to uh, my old buddy, John Brophy, who I grew up with, was living in Edgewater, and we became roommates. And this was at the time when Seinfeld was, like, really popular. And we would watch it every night at 11 o'clock. We called it the holy hour. Uh -huh. It was like whatever we did during the day, we made sure we were together to watch that Seinfeld episode. And we started to fantasize that we were kind of like characters in that show. And I was the Jerry, and he was the Kramer, because he had this sort of Kramer-esque, you know, he was very, still like that, kind of funny and, and a little clownish in a way, you know. So we had that thing going. And, it, and then John, who was our Kramer, signed us up for your reality tour. Oh. Bunch of friends, and we, we did that in, in 97. Wow. And, oh and so that was kind of the way, way our narratives kind of intersected. I wrote a book called My Life as a Novel in 2009 to explore the sort of interconnection between life and art and how there's a kind of in-between space, my life as a novel. And the subtitle is uh, Manifesto on the Activist as Hero and Other Ways to Not Be Bored. That's that book. Then I also had my first one-man show two years ago called How to Be an Actor in Your Own Life where I talk in that show also a lot about politics. And in my next one-man show, which I'll announce here to the world, is called Humanities 101. And I'm going to transform the theater into a classroom. So Professor John will be having class. And one of the issues that I, it's important to me is this idea of agency. Agency means to be an actor in your life, to be able to move through the world, to be able to make choices and act on them, to be an active person in the world, not passive. Okay. Now you, in your life, you got involved in politics, showing agency actually running for mayor of New York. Let's get into the political aspect of your life and how that, how did that evolve? Okay, Kramer for mayor. 
Can we talk about that in the one man show also? Do you get into that at all, or do you keep that separate? Or uh, the, yeah. the, the, my one man show starts with an introductory film that's five or six minutes long, and it mm. deals with you know a minute or two of it is running for mayor. Oh, okay. But uh, let's see, how did this all start? It started kind of as a publicity stunt. <laughs> you know, this yeah. was like. Uh, yeah. I, That's what Trump said. No. <laughs> I decided, like, you know, it was a uh, mayoral season. Yeah. This was, um, mm. I'm trying to think who, I think David Dinkins might have been the mayor at the time. Or Ed Koch, oh, right. one of those guys was. And uh, how did it happen? I just. Uh, you were a libertarian candidate. Well, no, that was when I really ran. Okay. Oh, but the first time I was announced that I was going to be a. A candidate in the Democratic primary for mayor. Okay, I was going to run as a Democrat, and uh, I got a lot of publicity about it. But then there was just so much work involved to do it. <laughs> Too much work. It was yeah, it was ridiculous. I knew I wasn't going to win, so I said, "The hell with it." Uh, you didn't go to the Democratic Party bosses and get their uh, approval, or no? I just I, I had to collect the. Uh, had to collect, I forget the number, I think it was like 5,000 signatures on a petition oh to get on God. the primary ballot. And what happened was I had gotten booked to do my one-man show in Australia for two months. Ooh. And it was cutting right into like the election season. Ah. And I would have had to hire people to get signatures. And I, you know, so I just bailed on the whole thing. I just okay. craved of retiring, not going to be the mayor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So... During the course of the years, I became friendly with uh, journalists. I've always nurtured my relationship with journalists. And mm. Uh, mm. so uh, let's see what, how, how did this happen. Okay, so um, I have this gig on New Year's Eve in Times Square in, in, a, in a studio to do a New Year's Eve internet radio show. Oh. And... Uh, I'm, I'm doing the gig, and, and in comes a, a buddy of mine who's the, uh, who's the, his name is, is uh, Baumgarten, Gary Baumgarten, who's the, uh, at the time, he was the bureau chief for CNN Radio. And so he pops into the studio, and he sees me, and he had done pieces with me before. We were friendly. And he says, uh, Crane, he says, can I get a sound bite from you? I said, sure. He says, well, you know, mayoral season is coming up again. you have any thoughts of running for mayor again? <laughs> I said, well, you know, if you can get a professional wrestler, it could be a governor. Why <laughs> Jesse Ventura. Yeah. Right, why can't I be a mayor? <laughs> so this little cute soundbite goes on to, you know, CNN was providing, like, these news updates to thousands of radio stations all over the world. And... Uh, that little soundbite about me, you know, if, oh. if, if a wrestler could become a governor, why can't I be the mayor? Wow. Is in heavy rotation for 24 hours. Every 20 minute news break is, is that thing. And as it turns out, the, the head of the New York Libertarian Party lives out in City Island, just happens to turn on the radio and hear this little story about the Kramer thinking of running for mayor. And he calls me up and he says, you know, uh, the president of the Libertarian Party, and do you have any thoughts of like actually running for mayor because the Libertarian Party might be interested in having you as our candidate? Mm. I said, I'll be honest with you, I don't know much about the Libertarian Party, but oh. uh, let me look into it and then I'll let you know. Oh. So I go on their website and the Libertarian Party is in line with like most of what I'm in line with. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, freedom, uh, to, yeah. you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, sure. less government, you know. Is it like Rand Paul is a libertarian? And yeah, yeah. like that. But, okay, but yeah. then I lose them like on the yeah. Second Amendment stuff, you know. Uh, yeah. You're more liberal. You're a New York liberal. Come on. Basically a New York liberal, and they're like, you know, <laughs> the world would be a safer place if everyone had a gun. A know? submachine gun walking around. Well, I, you know, I, I, I always said that, uh, you know, as far as carrying guns, I don't really, I said, I couldn't really espouse that as a plank in a platform bill. So the guy says, well, look, you don't have to say anything that you're not comfortable with, you know, if you're a candidate, you know, so I agreed to go to their convention. They had a convention. It was at the Holiday Inn on 57th Street. 
and I would have to like be nominated and Ooh. compete for who would be the libertarian candidate for mayor. This was the real deal. This was not a joke. You, this was a party nomination. Yeah, it's a wow. legitimate party. So at the uh, at the nominating meeting, uh, there were two candidates running. One was Kenny Kramer, and the other one was none of the above. <laughs> Okay. Fortunately, Kenny Kramer prevailed, well, that was good. You know? <laughs> and I became the Democratic candidate, the Libertarian candidate for mayor of New York City, which included having a whole organization that worked, because they had to get 7,500 signatures to get on the mayoral ballot. And, you know, and we were shooting for 10,000 in case you know, some of our signatures would be right. uh, disqualified. We wanted to make sure we were way ahead of the game so that... Huh. And so... Uh, Start getting up early, putting on a tie, change your lifestyle a little bit, or...? Well, I was getting a lot of media attention, oh. you know, and, uh, and I was making myself available for all kinds of media attention. Yeah. And, uh, you know, things were rolling along. I, I, we, submitted, we submitted our petitions and brought them down to the Board of Elections, and the guy just put a big check and said, you're on the ballot for mayor, and I was ready to go. And, <laughs> And, you know, I, I had some, some really funny ideas, but I also had some serious ideas. You know, in my campaign literature, I talked mm -hmm. about how important education is and how important parental involvement in education is. And I was suggesting that parents should get a report card, you know. That, mm -hmm. you know just, then I also had stuff like... Uh, that, you know, being in the tourism industry with my tour and everything, I'm concerned about, you know, how these mental hospitals are discharging patients to walk around the streets talking to themselves and it frightens tourists. So I'm going to provide them all with dummy cell phones. So they walk around talking to themselves with a cell phone. It wouldn't, it wouldn't scare anybody. Well, that's a practical idea. I ran out of cell phones. What I was going to do is I could pair up the people that hear voices with okay. the people that talk to themselves. So, so, okay. so, it would make, so I had a lot of that kind of stuff, okay. and then I had a couple of serious things okay. also. So I'm cooking away, you know. My my petitions are in. I'm on the ballot, and now I'm waiting for the uh, primary, to, where the Democrats or Republicans were going to, you know, choose who their candidate's going to be. The, Republicans chose Bloomberg, and mm. the Democrats chose, I forget who the Democrat was, I think it was a, it was, it was a Puerto Rican guy from the Bronx. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm waiting, it's, it's, you know, primary day, and I'm waiting to see, I'm on the ballot, I'm waiting to see who I'm competing against, uh -huh. and that day happened to be 9-11. Oh. That, that, that morning, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of people's lives were saved because a lot of it was the first day of school, mm. and a lot of parents took their kids for the first day of school. Mm -hmm. And also, a lot of people went to vote before they went to work, and that, that also yeah. saved a number of lives. Oh, wow. But after, you know, I had, I had organized a fundraising letter. Uh, I think there were like ten or 15,000 letters from a professional you know, mailing place um, asking for donations for my campaign. And, mm. And that was supposed to go out on like 9 12. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with what's going on oh, now, and, and, you know, and it just true. wasn't appropriate to be funny. No, not at all. So we held the letter off. And uh, mm. a few weeks later, I re edited it and so on, but mm. it barely paid for itself. Mm. And anyway, I got into the debates. You debated Bloomberg? No, the Bloomberg. You you were, you were guaranteed being in the debate if you were part of the uh, uh -huh. campaign finance board. Uh -huh. Bloomberg self financed, so he didn't have to debate anybody. Uh -huh. But I debated Mark Green. That was oh, of uh, Mark Green. Yeah. yeah, he was the public advocate who ran for mayor, right? And, okay. a, and, a, and a major putz, if I may say so. <laughs> A guy, a guy like running as a Democrat in a town where the Democrats outnumber the Republicans six to one yeah. and losing the election. Oh <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. He, was, he was an arrogant little oh. jerk. Anyway, so, uh, Mark, if you're watching. He you said it, not me, Mark. Every word of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so okay. uh, anyway, um, I got 2,000. 365 votes, something like that, okay. actual legitimate votes. Uh, yeah. Bloomberg kind of outspent me. We had a budget. We ended up spending, the party donated the money, and uh, 
they were a couple of very wealthy libertarians that put up, you, most that you could put up was like $5,000 with the maximum gift that you could make for, to a candidate. So we had a few of those, and you know, I got to all in all, maybe 35, 50,000 was spent on mm -hmm. campaign literature and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, uh, and then, of course, Bloomberg became the mayor. And I just uh, kept moving on. <laughs> well, Claudia says we have seven minutes left, so I want to make I want to raise the hopes of the country right now with a big announcement. How about Kenny Kramer for president, 2020? Way too much work. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank okay, you. Way too much work. Yeah. Well, here's a revelation for you, okay, Claudia? Who ran for president in 2012? I declared myself a candidate first in 2008. Symbolically, you know, I figure, why can't a teacher? I got no publicity, Kenny. I got zero. In fact, my father called me on the phone one day and he said, "John, I hope you realize you're only joking." <laughs> Say, thanks, Dad. You know, <laughs> no Joe Kennedy. <laughs> but uh, then in 2012, I ran again. I got zero corporate funding. I got zero votes. In fact, I didn't even vote for myself because I was ambivalent about my campaign. I wasn't on the ballot, but I'm like you. It's way too much work. I wouldn't want the job. Okay. Well, the idea to do it was for the publicity that yes. you had something else to sell. So were you selling a book? What were you selling? Absolutely. The TV show. Yeah, okay. Now, I may run again in 2020 just for publicity purposes. Okay. Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be on the ticket with me? Or? I, I, it's too much work. Too much work. Okay. <laughs> I think my political career is over. Okay. What's it like living in Hell's Kitchen? Well, you know, I've been here during a tremendous transition. Uh, yeah. You know, when I moved in, 42nd Street, the south side of 42nd Street, between 9th and 10th Avenue, is all these big, super modern high rises. They tore out all the theaters. Mm -hmm. you know, originally, when I moved into the building, the south side of 42nd Street, from yeah. 9th and 10th Avenue, was a red light district. I mean, oh. every business along there was like porno theaters, adult bookstores. Uh, peep shows. It sounds more Kramer-esque, if you ask me. I know, it was really hookers walking up and down that block day and night. And I can't tell you how much I miss the neighborhood. It was just... But gradually, you know, the, the 42nd Street Redevelopment Corporation, okay. you know, really got it together. And, you know, now it's, it's unbelievable that the, there's like 50, 60 story buildings in like a five block radius. Um, it, it's amazing to me how much money people have. At, like, you know, one-bedroom apartments are like four thousand a month rent. You know, uh, it's it's really the whole neighborhood's transition. And we lost all the mom and pop stores. Oh yeah. You know, because all those great mom and pop stores that had a ten-year lease for like five thousand a month, right. the lease is up. The landlord wants thirty-five thousand a month, and they're gone. Uh, you know, the only one that's really left is the Poseidon Bake Shop. Oh, the, the the Greek bakery, yes. The, yes. the Fable family owns right. that, and they own the building. That's Ernie and Astis goes there. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a great place, but... Uh, and the Westway Diner. Westway Diner, well, that, no, that came about, like, later. Okay. It used to be a place called Kraft, which is now Theater Row Diner. It used to be on the corner of 10th Avenue and 42nd. Now it's on Dyer okay. and 42nd. But the, the whole neighborhood has gone through uh, incredible gentrification. And, uh, you know, you could have bought these brownstones. But I have a friend of mine in real estate who was buying those five-story walk-ups, you know, mm -hmm. on 48th, 49th, 50. Mm -hmm. He's paying, like, max 50, 60 grand a piece for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all rent control, but when the tenant dies or moves out, they get a brand-new kitchen, a brand-new right, ceiling, right, right, and a brand-new right. everything, and uh -huh. the rent goes from 400 a month to, like, uh, 2,400 a month. Big issue, big you so it's keep the rents low for people but it's just amazing how many people have that kind of money that they could afford yeah. uh, these buildings that just keep going up and up and up over by the javits center now they're yeah. building a city that's going to be uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, housing and uh, hotels and shopping malls and it's, uh, it's there goes the neighborhood. Uh, there goes my view. I have a <laughs> goes uh, yeah. I, I have a beautiful terrace on the 35th floor overlooking the Hudson River. I oh. face I face south and west, and my west is like I keep losing the river. 
South is okay, except I just lost the Freedom Tower. They put a building up in front of the Freedom Tower. I might have to run for mayor again and put a stop to that. Something about rezoning this rezoning. area. <laughs> That's right. Would it be an exaggeration, Kenny, to say that Seinfeld was the last great American TV show that was like that a lot of people watched it? Because now it seems like 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 you go back to the fifties. You had I Love Lucy. Everybody watched it. Everybody watched it. It was, yeah. it was, it was, it was a similar sort of thing. It was an ensemble of actors. Yeah. Um, now yeah. it's all splintered. There's all these little niches that people watch. It's because there's so many more outlets for media. I okay. mean, you know, you have you know, Netflix and you have uh, Amazon and they're all doing their own programming now and, and creating stuff. And so, you know, you go back to like the 50s or 60s, there were three networks, you know. Mm. Now you have, what, I have 1,200 channels on my cable. And nothing's on. <laughs> I managed to find stuff. I've been watching, I've been binge watching Jerry's Comedians and Cars Going for Coffee. Oh, really? okay. Yeah, it's interesting, you know. It's it's not set to be a funny show, it's uh -huh. just guys yeah. talking about life, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really a show about nothing. That's truly the show about nothing. Yeah. But uh, just to have so many opportunities uh, yes. for, for, you know, to... What's interesting about you, Kenny, what's wonderful about you, it's, it's very important, I think, because you're sort of like a guru type, you know, you sort of like harken back to the 60s, a little bit like that, but your life inspired this character in a show, it kind of makes other people think like, gee, like, what, how could my own life be engaging or interesting enough to be to be part of something more important or, or bigger or... Yeah. It's all due to Larry David. I mean, Larry's a genius and Larry saw something in me that he thought would make a good character on a TV show and, uh, and he went with it. And, you know, it was just a series of flukes that the show even became a hit. You know, as I told you before about getting the time slot after Cheers, and yeah. and in the beginning, it, it, the, the pilot didn't test well, and they were going to can the whole thing, NBC, but they had a show called Movie of the Week, and yeah. Castle Rock produced Seinfeld, and there were some Rob Reiner films that they wanted for Movie of the Week, yeah. Spinal Tap, Stand By Me, Princess Bride, and to get the deal, to get those broadcast rights to those movies, they let Seinfeld make four episodes. Well, I'm going to I'm going to respectfully also disagree and say there's something unique about you and authentic about your personality and naturally funny that you know I'm not modest for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Claudia has given us a time up sign. I feel like we've just begun a conversation with uh, the amazing Kenny Kramer here in Hell's Kitchen at the Producers Club Theater. The uh, inspiration for the Seinfeld character Kramer and a very wonderful, personable, interesting man. We wish him luck with your show and everything in the future. Good things ahead and uh, hope this conversation goes on. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye, okay. <laughs> folks. All right. Thank <laughs> you.